We have another special guest on the line right now, guitarist Dwayne Bailey. Can you hear me, Dwayne? I can hear you. <laughs> Let me know if I need to turn down the background music or anything. Dwayne oh, is no, I love it. Dwayne is a uh, guitarist that uh, had the uh, task of filling Terry's shoes when he was playing with Chicago from 1980. Six to ninety-five. Do I have that right? Right. The beginning of uh, basically the cusp of ninety-four to ninety-five. And uh, you grew up in uh, Manhattan, Kansas, uh, sort of west of Topeka and Lawrence. Um, you had played in bands in the '60s and liked bl- bands with horns. And so you were a fan of Chicago's right away uh, with the first album. Well, you know, um, the whole country at that time, their horn bands all through the 60s uh, were, were big. You know, James Brown and Sly Stone and, and show bands were, were real big, you know, in the mid-60s. Everybody uh, wearing matching suits and doing steps. And all that stuff. So, and then my older brother is a guitar player, and he played in horn bands. He's the one that that first handed me the CTA album about a week after it was released. And he said, "Here, check this out," because he knew I was, you know, I played all the time, played in bands, and and then uh, uh, not long after that, I I joined a, a bunch of guys in their twenties when I was about sixteen, and and uh, it was a nine-piece band with a four-piece horn section. We played. CTA and Blood, Sweat, and Tears like everybody else. So, uh, and that's also around the first time I ever saw Chicago at uh, Pershing Auditorium in Lincoln, Nebraska. And that was the only time I ever saw them because uh, they just, you know, Manhattan is kind of obscure for uh, concerts and stuff. But but anyway, yeah, I, I was totally ready for it because I was, you know, by the late 60s, with Hendrix and Cream and all these bands and all the psychedelic stuff going on, we, the, old, the older brothers and sisters were into uh, the show band kind of thing, but Chicago broke that mold, and they're the ones that, they bridged uh, show bands with Hendrix, basically, and got rid of the matching suits and got rid of the, the steps and all the shtick, you know, all that kind of stuff, all that Vegasy stuff, and um, and that's why it hit everybody so hard because it was such an amazing uh, fresh mix of of a horn band with like Hendrix uh, inspired. I have a actually a quote that you had put on your website about seeing Chicago at that Nebraska concert in the early seventies and. You yeah. you called Terry intense, radical, rebellious, funny, spontaneous, possessing major attitude, playing loud, hard, soft, slow, and fast with great precision. And you said Terry's fire and spirit impressed you the most. Yeah, because, you know, being a guitar player, I, I related to him the most. Plus, you know, before Terry, uh, when you're... When you're stuck in a in a farm state like Kansas, and you don't you're not growing up in a metropolis like L.A. or Chicago or New York, you know your your influences are few and far between unless you want to be in a, a country western band or whatever. So guys like me and Terry Livgren, uh, who is from Topeka, mm-hmm. from the band Kansas, uh, yeah, right, Kansas, and. Uh, so, you know, we had few people to look up to when we were looking for more progressive kind of stuff. So Hendrix was our guy, you know, like when he came on the scene, all of a sudden we had our astronaut, you know. And and then uh, when Terry came out, and then to see him live, he was uh, like another little astronaut. And uh, I love... Uh, I love horn sections and I love playing with them, but uh, I related more as a guitar player to Terry than I than say a flute player, because you know nobody was at, at uh, Monterey Pop Festival 
throwing their flute on the stage and lighting it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make the movie anyways if it did happen. So, no, I, I, I found it interesting that you mentioned that uh, Kerry Livgren uh, and Kansas had a, a horn section in the early days, and they actually used to cover South California purples. Right. They also did Paul 58, and... Uh, wow. Cherry or uh, Cherry Livgren was a huge uh, uh, Terry Cass fan. He also played a an SG, and uh, you know he was at the time they were they had uh, a couple horn players, and it was just such a different thing than what they ended up being with violin and all that stuff. But it was an entirely different band. It was you know. Kansas broke up. Kerry had all this music he had written and, and a band name, and he took the band name and all his tunes and joined this band called White Clover, who had a violinist and a whole different lead singer and all that. And they just evolved from there. But yeah, they. That's why uh, when I first saw them and they had uh, a couple horns, that the Chicago stuff was a natural form. Plus, they did. You know, Zappa had a lot of horns, and Soft Machine had a sax player, and sure. King Crimson had horns. So it was it was horn stuff, but it wasn't you know this more progressive uh, rather than you know typical show band kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Hey, I I do need to mention real quick. It's just past the ten o'clock hour. You're listening to W O R T eighty nine point nine FM in Madison and W O R T H D. We're in the midst of a special on the late great guitar player Terry Kath of the group Chicago, which we'll be doing until the 11 o'clock hour. And right now we're speaking with guitarist Dwayne Bailey, who besides uh, playing with Chicago in the late 80s and early 90s, had also recorded with Robert Lamb's solo projects, as well as uh, Bob Seeger and Stu Hamm. And uh, also some early recordings with songwriter uh, Gerard McMahon, which I found very interesting. Uh, I'm familiar with some of his early work. Right. Epic Caribou, with, uh, his first album had some of the Chicago guys on it, on Gersio's label, and Gersio produced it. I have, they've, been, uh, they've been around each other a long time. A couple other uh, quotes that you had given me uh, in an earlier uh, email transaction you you had about Terry, I just want to mention quick. Um, you said that you never th really thought of Terry in terms of just being a guitarist. I mean, he'll always be known as Chicago's guitarist, but they they had that chemistry of starting out together and staying together throughout you know all the the club gigs to being one of the, the biggest bands of the 70s. And you know, Terry uh, was equal parts, you said, West Montgomery, Jimi Hendrix, with a fair amount of Paul Bunyan and Evil Knievel thrown in for good <laughs> and not so good measure. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, of, of course you could draw some parallels there to the way he passed away, but, uh, you know, I think of his, his guitar playing, especially with the live material, and hopefully uh, we've, uh, we've showcased some of that on the program tonight, as really being almost reckless at times. It's like he just had such a go-for-it attitude. Um, at, at times it almost seems like his solos were like a half step ahead of the rest of the band and he was pulling the band yeah. along with him I mean he could really drive a rhythm you know well yeah well Terry see that's the thing Terry if he would have had other occupations if he hadn't gone into music I could see him as a football player can you imagine Terry Kath coming at you with a football <laughs> <laughs> you know or a a uh, he could have operated a jackhammer. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's just such a big, strong, outdoorsy guy. You know, I mean, he could, I could I could see him on uh, Duck Dynasty. Yeah, you know, if he was a linebacker coming at me, I, I don't know whether I'd be that intimidated because he'd probably have that big ear-to-ear -ear grin on his face, you know, right before he'd cream you. <laughs> yeah. What, what yeah, do you... Oh. What do you think set Terry apart from other guitarists, and and why why doesn't he enjoy the same kind of like guitar hero status as like a Jeff Beck or an Eric Clapton? 
Well, I think a lot of that is because uh, Jeff, Be- you know, for one, Jeff Beck and and Clapton and Jimmy Page and all these guys, you know, they were from England. And, you know, the Beatles, the whole British invasion of the 60s, you know, the, the Chicago invasion didn't have the effect that the Beatles or the uh, British invasion did. You know, the, the Chicago invasion was basically when CTA came out with the, with Flock. They were on CBS. Aorta was on CBS. Uh, Buckingham's, you know, they were on CBS. And all that, that stuff. So... Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I think uh, Americans tend to take a lot of stuff for granted. Uh, you know, the old saying that a, a prophet is not accepted in his homeland. And, uh, you know, it's that kind of thing, I think, that that, uh, that and the fact that Chicago is famous for not getting the respect they deserve, uh, mm-hmm. you know, because of the route that they took with ba- after, if you leave me now, and ballads and all that. Right. And plus, Clapton and Jeff Beck, they, you know, they weren't in a horn band doing If You Leave Me Now. But at the same time, Clapton, uh, you know, he'd come out on the radio with a song like You Look Wonderful Tonight. Mm-hmm. You know, but, but he still had Cream in his back pocket and Hendrix and all those guys. You know, they were featured players in, it, in sure. trios. And Perry didn't come out that way, and he was... He was hidden within a seven-piece band. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. I, I still sort of feel that the, the way he passed, too, was such a shock, I think, to people that uh, it, it was hard to talk about for a while. And the fact that it also happened at that time when uh, they had reached that apex of a, a ballad kind of a band too so they weren't really thought of as a guitar band that much at that point in time exactly that, they, they were more song you know like yeah. once the hits started coming they became more song based yeah. instead of instead of uh, Grateful Dead jam band based mm-hmm. well but the stuff the stuff you've been playing tonight though from Carnegie Hall and all that were serious long jams featuring Terry you know and that was I guess that was what around seventy one or something yep. where yep. The, the the ballads and stuff didn't really happen until like color my world if you leave me now and all that. Mm-hmm. Yep, and we got some more live stuff coming up in in the show, and uh, you know I'm I'm hoping that with this interest in the documentary film that Michelle's making and uh, through the internet groups and all that that you know we can help to uh, boost him up onto that mantle where he deserves to be and, or right definitely and also new, new stuff just seems to pop out almost every day you know yeah. new photos uh obscure uh recordings and mm-hmm. you know so is even though the internet isn't really all that new anymore it's still new enough to where you know it's bringing more people together and it's uh more people are are uh, coming up with stuff out of their archives and finding a way to post it. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's going to be some amazing stuff in the next, you know, by the time uh, the documentary comes out, uh, I think there's going to be some more uh, cool finds that she'll be able to add to it. Mm -hmm. We uh, actually got some rare material coming up uh, in the last 50 minutes or so of the show, so something for right. the, the listeners to look forward to but right. uh speaking of the music that's what it's all about and i should probably get back to it uh, i wanted to thank absolutely want to thank you Dwayne. Uh, i i know that uh you know besides being uh, a professional uh, guitarist and musician that you're also a big fan of terry's and it was really important for me to get you involved in the program tonight oh yeah i tell you the people always go no, it, it must have been a really weird trying to fill Terry Cash's shoes, and you go, bro, I I could barely fill his diaper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pretty much leave it at that. Well, thanks again, Dwayne. Uh, it's, it's been great talking to you, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, speak again on a future program when we talk uh, a little bit more about uh, some of your other projects and some of your current music. You're doing a great job, and I love the show, the whole 
the whole show. You're doing a great job, and I hope it becomes an annual thing. I think that's where we're going with this, Dwayne. So (laughs) if I have my say, and uh, since it is community radio and I'm basically programming my own show, uh, I I sort of do have (laughs) the say. We will keep doing this every, uh, every January 31st or thereabouts. Have fun, and happy birthday, Terry Cass. Thanks, Dwayne. Take care. You got it.